Hello and welcome to the Rangers Rabble. It's uh, another special, another meets episode, and this time, absolutely delighted to say, we've got the former Rangers right back um, who's frozen on my screen. Have you? Are you right there? <laughs> it just froze for a second there for me. But we've got former Rangers right back, former Scotland international, of course, uh, among many other clubs. Mo, absolute pleasure to have you. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Fantastic stuff. So we'll um. We'll jump straight in because uh, I know we're obviously a little bit for time and well, it's got so many questions. I'll have to probably skip a few as well, um, <laughs> but, but I'm sure we'll get there. Um, but just just sort of the, the one thing we, we, we tend to ask um, guests straight away is, is um, when, you know, when you're coming up as, as a young lad, are you just like miles better than everyone? Is that, do, you, do you know you're, you're that good as a young lad before you sort of get scouted by one of the top teams? No, no. I, I mean, well, I certainly, I certainly wasn't. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of stumbled across football. It was, you know, you just play with your friends and and whatnot. And then, yeah, it was it was basically Dundee United that that kind of alerted me and my, and my mother um, that they were interested in, in me. Which obviously, when that happens, you then think, okay, then you kind of must be better than 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 what's yeah. around you. Um, but no, I, no, I don't think that's in your mind when you're growing up. You know, I, I was extremely fast. That was probably my biggest thing, rather than talent as such. Um, so that was my extreme that probably helped me in, in my career. Brilliant. Um, so when, when do you? You said you were at Dundee United. Is that sort of signed as a as a youth to Dundee United? When when did you hear that sort of Rangers were first interested? Um, well, no, Dundee United took me into training when I was ten. Um, oh, okay. So it was like 10 and then Aberdeen came in and came with them once a week. But I knew Rangers were, were watching me from when I was about 12, but they never approached me until I was 14. Oh, right. Okay. They, they kind of just monitored me for two years. And and then that was that. As soon as I knew Rangers were interested in me, you know, then the Scotland things kick in and then the English clubs and that start looking at you and whatnot. So it was an exciting time as a young boy, you know, training with different teams and, and flying down there and Arsenal and Man United and all these wow. things. Um, it was quite, you know, it was, it was exciting but nerve wracking as well because you're, you're just a wee boy eh? and you, you've been mm. in there, you're seeing all these players, you know, special talents. You think, geez, they're special. Um, but no, it's exciting time, really exciting. That's amazing. So, so when when Rangers come, you say you, you're 14. Uh, you talked about yeah. Arsenal, man. You, are they are there other offers on the table down in England? And and if so, what what why was Rangers the pick of the bunch? Um, I, I had basically we narrowed it down to three teams that that I enjoyed. Um, uh, Rangers was one, Man City was the other, and uh, Newcastle. Um, so Newcastle had offered me a deal. Man City had offered me a deal. And I mean, I think at the time it was like a thirty thousand pounds signing on fee for Man City. Six hundred pounds, seven hundred pounds, eight hundred pounds was the, the kind of contract, yeah. and I signed and I signed for Rangers for what seventy five quid a week. Um, <laughs> when they signed them, um, I just I don't know, I just had a feeling that Rangers was the place I wanted to be. That's amazing. Do you do your family try and push you any way with that, or are they just happy with your own decision? Or well, my mum was my, the only thing that my mum was really pushy on was that, that I finished school. Um, yeah. And I was not allowed to sign for anybody until I was a man, she says. So that was my yeah, 16th, 17th birthday, she said, then you can decide because she she didn't think you'd be mature enough to make the right call. So she just told all the all the clubs kinda like Morris will be making his decision when he's a man, basically. Um Wow. That was it. That's amazing. I mean we're we're always told as kids that uh you have to get your school grades, otherwise you never make a professional footballer. But I guess you know, we we know that talent definitely overrides school grades. Um, so so when you're in, you know, you're in the youth team. I guess sort of what, mid to late nineties at, at that stage. Mm-hmm. Are you getting to see any of the the first team? Which I imagine it's sort of Gorham, Coisty, Gaza. Are you, are you getting to see any of these guys on a on a daily basis at all? Well, we, well, we were we were skivvies for the first team. So it was it was back in the day when young boys actually had to do something. Um, I know they turn up and they get their sea bus served on a plate for them and, and they go home and that's them done. Um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, we were really close quarters. So it was it was like kind of, kind of like a big family. It was like 50, 50 people in this building that were all really close and we ate together. We we yeah, we, we had jobs to do for the first team. 
Um, so, I mean, don't get me don't get me wrong. It was still, you know, when Ali McCoy walked past you or, or, or Gordon Jury walked past you, you could you always you always straightened up. You know, I was never too yeah. formal with the first team because there was there was personalities in there that were formal with the first team because it was their personalities like we Peter McDonald, Jimmy Gibson, um, Kurt Willoughby. You know, they would all like laugh and joke with the first team, but I was yeah, too, yeah, yeah. a bit too straight away. So I was kind of. Uh, a bit more geeky um, than than they was, but no, it was a good environment because there was no there was a no nonsense approach. You know, the the dressing room ran itself, the club yeah. ran itself, and then if there's anything that was over the top, then then the, um, late Walter Smith would, would would need to step in. But now there was a real discipline within the, within the building. Yeah, I mean, you just mentioned Walter Smith there. Was he? Did he take a big interest in, in the youth team at that? Because I know some managers like to leave it to the youth coaches, but was he big on the youth? Well, again, it's because we were in this building together, it was so so, so much co- like the close quarters. Um, but I just always remember, like, he, he, would, he would come in the game. You know, Archie would come in the games and they would always ask you because I was, I was the manager's kit boy. So I was right. in the office every day. So... You know, he uh, was very, very approachable. Scary, scary light, but just <laughs> really, really approachable man. And I remember a, a lovely story. Um, my mum, mum, and a partner at the time, they, they, they came through on a, I think it was, hug, no, it was a, I think it was a, a hug money or something like that, a game, a friendly game at Starks Park. And my mum being, you know, didn't know it was a closed door game and nor did I. So my mum kind of sneaks in. She gets into the building um, with my wee sister just born. And Walter Smith left the dugout and walked. You know how it's like a corner stand at Wraith Rovers? Yeah. Old wooden Starts. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and he just sat there the whole second half and tucked into my mum's homemade suit uh, in a flask. <laughs> um, just sat there and chatted and was telling my mum how I was getting on and what I need to work on. And, just you know, it just wouldn't happen these days. Just right. class, class guy. Yeah, that's amazing. That's so good. Um, <clears throat> we spoke to Jimmy Gibson not so long ago, um, and, and, and we were yeah, we were just looking at the. Um, he did have a very good things to say about you as well, um, but we we were just looking at the youth team and, and saying how it was, you know, it wasn't quite a class of ninety two situation, but there was a lot of lot of talent within that youth team. Obviously, Barry Ferguson was a standout, but you had yourself, you had Jimmy. Um, there was there were so many guys at Barry Nicholson as well, Scott Wilson, Peter McDonald. You mentioned these, these guys all went on to sort of, you know, filter into the first team in, in some way. Um, did you did you sort of know that, that these were special special players? And, and is it just it's just tough to make that break for a club as big as Rangers? I think the word special gets thrown about. <clears throat> there were special talents in that group. Special talent was Barry. <clears throat> the outstanding talent was Barry. Yeah. There was another player called Stevie McAdam who was it's a crime that that boy never, you know, because of his injuries, it's a crime. He was he was a 10 out of 10 footballer. 10 out of really? 10. Oh, he was wow. special. Stevie McAdam. Um, I thought Jimmy Gibson was a special talent. Again, kind of blight, kind of blighted the injury. Um, who else was in there that was a special talent? Paul McKnight actually was a special talent. Um but yeah, but what what we what we had was we had a a really hard working, tough mentality that whole that whole squad, um, because obviously they, they, there's a couple of years of overlap in there. Barry was a couple of years older than me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it was like a four year kind of generation of you know I mean that a lot of the boys played in that first team. But what I see now is they get a, they come into the first team now and they get one game against. A League One team in the cup, and then you never see them again. And, and you know they're they're playing a part of Thistle or, or they're, they're, they go to the game, you know. And yeah, I just when you look at that squad there, that I mean, the careers that these boys have had. I mean, Peter McDonald, fantastic career. Andy Dowie, fantastic career. Um, so yeah, it, it was the environment that they created this tough, hard working, sturdy type that that, that can that can hold their own in, in any dressing room which I think that was the key to it yeah of course there was there was talented footballers in there as well um, but I think it was the mentality that, that, that was in the football club in the days Do you think any of that held any of them lads back because I mean when we spoke to Jimmy Jimmy sort of said that 
he, obviously he had his injury problems, but he, he always said he would have he would have loved to have been able to sort of take your your work ethic and your fitness, and 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 put that into himself to to have maybe made it at Rangers. But I think we, 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 most people have probably got a, a regret or two, and mm. but. <clears throat> You know, youth is wasted on the young. It's it's one of the ones that you, you only really get one chance at it. Um, and I made peace with myself quite quick that I wasn't on the same level as Jimmy Gibson or a Bob Markham. So I just took on it myself. Well, what can I control? Because I wasn't when I first went to Rangers, I was the unfittest there. Really, unfittest. So when I they, they used to always take the mick out of me, um, and I was always last at the running. Uh, first pre-season, I was, uh, the, the doctors actually stopped me training because they thought I had a problem in my heart. Um, and the, the boys used to take the mick at me. So what I then did was I just went, now nah, I'm not going to have this feeling again. So when mm. the doctors gave me the OK, that was like a kind of pivotal moment in my career where I just thought, nah, I'm not going to have anybody slagging me for lack of fitness. And and it was John Brown, he just took me under his wing. And when they were all running about, it was, um, you know, Cleaning the boots and that, I was I was doing the wee corridors. And Bomber was running me up and down the stairs and just away for the people that nobody knew I was doing it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and that that was kind of the key to me getting into the first team. Wow. Um, we we move on. We get sort of uh, ninety ninety eight. Then Ad- Advocate comes in. Mm. Um, were there any sort of big changes in in the way that the youth system ran, or did it just sort of? mainly stay the same. Did, did he look at coming and, and bringing a couple of those guys up? So I mean, obviously he built a team around Barry Ferguson to a degree, but were there any others? Well, in, in, the, in the days, the under-21 rule was there as well. So you had to have, I think, two in your squad or in the bench, which probably helped me in quicker. Um, but listen, again, you're at Murray Park. That was the first year of Murray Park when, when Dick Advocat came in. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I've actually talked about special talents and no mentioned this boy, Stevie Hughes. Oh. What a player yeah. he was. Steve oh, is, special, yeah. special boy. I mean, 65 kilos, but what a football player. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, Stephen came in, Al McGregor came in. I mean, there was there was lots of talented boys there that we can, we can rhyme off. Mark Brown, a big goalkeeper, did well. Um, so, aye. But no, the, 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 the one thing that did change in the building was the, the foreigners that come into the football club really enhanced the, the, the culture of the club in terms of diet, eating properly. Yeah. Um, that changed slightly and, you, and you, could, you, could definitely, you could definitely sense that. Gone with the banging the heads off the wall before the Celtic game ready to fight. It was calm and relaxed and they're sitting there with their legs crossed in their espresso, you know what I mean? It was, it was different. It was different. It was still that edgy side to the club, of course, with your Keg Moors and Barry Ferguson and whatnot, but it was just, it was just I don't know. It just felt it was a nice environment, so it was a classic yeah, environment. Think, I think I heard you speak before about the sort of <clears throat> the, the diet side of things that the, the foreign guys brought. I think you said, was you saying something about uh, Ronald De Boer with his sort of strawberries on toast and, and his sugar and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So it's it's fascinating to see sort of that. Shit. I mean, was it was it completely different in terms of diet just be- before they came in? Um, well, what, when we were at, when we were at Ibrox. Then you're basically getting your your pasta dish, your fish dish, your chicken dish. It was chicken and beans, fish and beans. You know, it was it was all good food. But yeah, when we went up to Murray Park, it was just a different. It was just a different level. There was way more veg. There was um, just a, a way more choice. Um, and yeah, and, and you, you know, I think anybody you can be a kind of product of your, of your environment. If you're sitting next to somebody and they're having a full plate. Of, Parma- uh, broccoli with parmesan on it you start thinking oh maybe I'll try that and you know and you just it kind of rubs off and you listen of course there was times on Saturday night you're having your curry and whatnot of course but just day-to-day standards were, were, were quite high yeah it's amazing um just just looking at your sort of you know we, we go off the back of a, a treble winning season you, you go on to make your debut um against Dundee mm-hmm. are, are you are you aware that you're, uh, sorry, not you aware. Are you involved in the training in the first team? This because when we spoke to Jim, Jim obviously made one or two appearances around then, mm-hmm. and and he said that he had no idea he was even going to be in the the squad. He wasn't training with the first team. He was just uh, obviously with the under twenty one rule you mentioned. He was mm-hmm. just called up mm-hmm. one day. Was that was that the same with you, or were you sort of brought into the training? Uh, well, what the the Walter Smith way was always 
the best, the ones that were doing best, but not quite ready to team with the first team, or the numbers were, were too high or whatever, you would collect balls for the first team. So you were getting used to the environment, you were getting used to the training, the intensity and whatnot, by just seeing it. Um, yeah. But then it comes a point where you're too good to be with the 18s or the 21s, and then you're, <clears throat> you're up with the first team most days. And then, you know, the big amazing day when you just get told that you went for a number to a name on your on your training kit. So I remember that first day when I, I reported to Murray Park and I was running a bombers bit and he just went, you're doing that in there. Like, wow. And then you just see your name and you're sitting next to Barry Fergus and Neil McCann. You know, it's just, it's just, all, it's just like all the years of hard work and you just think, oh, now I've got a chance here. Now that's, that's the start. That's no, you made it now. That's you just... <laughs> Now the hard work starts, um, but no, it was it was a wonderful, wonderful. I can I can still remember it um, really clearly. But um, just just being at the time because it was a new new training center. It was it's like a spa basically, you know. It was <laughs> just awesome. I um, mean, you look at the Murray Park now or Rangers training center now. It's 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 a phenomenal building. Yeah, yeah. Still, I mean, it, it's sort of money going around in the in the English Premier League and, and Murray Park. Oh. You know, whatever we want to call it now, Rangers Training Centre sort of holds its own still. Um, that you know, when you're you know you're fully fledged in, you're you're, you're training with the first team every day. When Rangers are bringing in these players, the Devors, the Flows, two guys, all these guys. I mean, the level of training must be insane to compared to what you're obviously coming up through the youth training. How much better do you think you get? Because obviously, we're probably never going to see that era again with those that level of player. I mm. you might get one or two that that, that some no. come down at the end of the career, but you'll never get no. what we were signing at the time. How good was training and how special were those players to just be around and, and learn from? Oh, the the difference in me in six months was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Because <laughs> um, if you if you because it moves so fast, the, the the quality of these players, they move so fast and they, they zip the ball about so quick, they see things yeah. two, three seconds before you. So you need to start training your mind to start evaluating three, four seconds before it's even coming to you. Because if no, somebody's t- tackling you and your teammates shouting at you and your the manager's not going to pick you. So it's it's really quick. And and it was just too, it was sometimes too much for, for for some of the young lads that come up, and and ultimately then they moved on. Um, but yeah, this, I mean, I mean you you talk about players. That, I mean we always talk about the same players, but like you see, like Christian Nerlinger, like. It's a Bayern Munich. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you've got um, Jonas Tern, no, Swedish international. Yeah. Claudio Reyna, phenomenal football player. And these were just the norm. These weren't even the stars, like Gio yeah. and, and, and whatnot. Um, but you, can, you can't help but learn for these for these boys, you know. But, just, but, but also, it's, I found that it's, it's intimidating as well, mate. Intimidating. You're going up every day. Now, I'm going up on the bus. This was before my part. I was going up on the bus to Lens. We trained at Lensy or Steps or something like that. And I'm just looking at these players going, geez, old man. Like, you're nervous just to go to training. You know you need to be on it. Yeah. So it was like a constant fight or flight mode you're in. Um, but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Yeah, I always just look back and obviously did the research for the, for the interviews and that. It just... Uh, you were almost spoiled, weren't you, as a uh, as a Rangers fan? I was spoiled, but it was just seeing some of these players. Like obviously, the ball coming in from Barca, even players like Nerlinger with with Bayern and Dortmund and, and things like that, and, and Klos, of course, Champions League winner. You're getting just it's it was just a crazy, crazy era. Um, you sort of 0102 comes along. You know, you're you're sort of in and out of the team as well. But as a young lad, I guess you just any minute is is minutes that are developing you as a player. Um, as as Dick Avocat at this point, has he had a word view? Is he is he sort of made it any inclination that, you, that you're his long term right back in in his hope or just challenging you every day? Every day. Well, his philosophy was that we needed two players for every position. So at that time it was Rickson and I, and then obviously I could play left back as well. So I, I was sometimes if, if Newman was injured or whatever, I could fill in at left back as well. So. Um, but no, nah, nah, these conversations are not happening. It's no, nah. nah, you know, every single transfer window, there's four internationals coming in. <laughs> so, 
I, I, I loved it. It was exciting. I used to love like see, like you know, these are boys that I would, I would have on the front of my cover of my, my maths book. You know, the shoot magazine, Ronald De at a World Cup. You know, Claudio Canigia at a World Cup. You know, and, and then next minute you're you're sitting here and lunch with them and and listening to their stories and hearing him how they talk on the football pitch. Just a different class, really different class. But the good, good, good people as well. Like, yeah. Uh, all the top boys, they just behave imp- impeccably. Um, wow. Yeah, so it, uh, it, was, it was a real experience and, and something that I'm, I'm very, very fond of like, when I think back at the time. But was there no, like, sort of, they were just great, there was no egos in there or anything? Oh, there was ego. Oh, Christ. <laughs> oh, egos, jeez, oh. You're in a team for 22 internationalists. There's eagles in there. Big ammo, geez, oh, big ammo. He was some boy. Uh, <laughs> what, a, what a player he was. Um, yeah, but listen, you, I think you've got to have an ego. To, to, you've got to, I mean, you're in there with 22 boys that all want your position. Yeah. I mean, you've got to have ego to be a Rangers player for me. Rangers set up player. You've got to have that broad shoulders to go in. and Because it's, it's no natural to go in a and a football pitch with 50,000 people there and, yeah, and definitely. go and take the ball and it's nil-nil and the crowd are booing and it's, it's unnatural. Um, but no, the, but when I'm saying ego, you know, the, there wasn't any clowns and it was, it was, they were all proper, proper athletes, proper footballers, you know, with a level of class. I, I, I just, I just love being in and but amongst it every day. I really did. How did you find, um, you, you know, you mentioned Ibrox, you mentioned playing in front of 50,000. How, how did you find that? Because I, I always found, like, it's something I've said, I've, I've grown up with it, I was I was used to how the crowd are, but, you know, I noticed my friends in, in England and things like this, that I brought um, a Liverpool fan up uh, once to uh, Ibrox, and I can't remember if we playing Falkirk or someone, and it was like the first pass, the first misplaced pass, and the whole crowd are on the back, they're on the backs of the players, and he couldn't believe it. He was literally like, what we don't do this in Liverpool. Like, if there's a misplaced pass, it's, it's nothing like that. The crowd don't react like that. It's like mm. constant pressure. How, how do you react? Is it? Can you feel that when you're on the pitch? That the crowd's sort of getting restless. Why? But again, the training regime and the the way we were brought up in that building. If you have a misplaced pass, you're getting three or four other players slaughtering you yeah. at that time for standards and, and uh, so it was a constant. You were you're kind of indoctrinated into it already. So. Yeah, that's why you don't get a ball away. Just get it to Barry and keep it simple. Don't be trying any <laughs> fancy crap. Just get to Barry and run beyond it. That was me. Um, yeah, but now nah, listen, of course. But at Ibrox, it's it's and an Celtic Park. You kind of pick out any one sentence. Do you know what I mean? It's just it's yeah. just like white noise. Um, because when you go to the smaller stadiums, you can hear people what they're saying. Yeah. Which is probably it's a wee bit worse than than than, than <laughs> the general kind of noise, um, but that whole fear of you know that you're going to get pelters if you get a ball away. It's just a constant elation when you do when you are playing well and you yeah. put a good cross in and or you go and smash somebody in the halfway line and just all these things. I just miss it. I wish I can go back to it, honestly. Just go back and play football again. <laughs> Uh, there's, a good, there's a good question at the end that sort of touches on that a little bit. Um, just this, I mean, this wasn't sort of on my list, but we've sort of spoken about players that maybe should have made it and players that could have gone on further. Um, so it's, it's completely off topic. But but with Barry, are you, were you surprised that when when he did move on from Rangers eventually that, that it was to Blackburn and maybe not somewhere bigger? Because like, as a kid, and like Barry's obviously most most kids' heroes growing up, I think at that stage, it's I think everyone was a bit shocked that this guy was so good on the ball we could. You know, he was, he was one of the stars of a quality side um, that, that maybe everyone thought he was going to go on to some much bigger things. I mean, Blackburn's still a big club, but we thought he was going to go much bigger. Well, I could have played for Barcelona. Wow. That's how good I think he is. Wow. Um, when I think of Barry <laughs> and I look at Arteta, Arteta was a really good footballer as well. But for me, I'm taking Barry ahead of Arteta. So, yeah. To then say, yeah, yeah, I think Abari should have went and played for an Arsenal. Um, yeah, yeah, I think he could have played with Arsenal easily, to be honest. Um, I would like to have seen him play in Spain as well because he was so cultured. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, but one, one thing you, that people people talk about Barry being some player all the time, which he, which he was, but it was his drive, honest to God. 
just was never satisfied. Three and a half, I want four and a half, four and a half, I want five and a half. It was just constant. Such a such a drive to drive not just himself on, but other people as well. Kind of like Roy Keane would be at Man United, I would imagine. Mm. Never satisfied, and, and that, that comes down to character. Um, and, and that's sometimes maybe not touched on. Um, but yeah, special talent. He should have been Arsenal, Chelsea, whoever. Really could have been. Yeah. It's, I know, I know it's like how, how I feel, how everyone else feels. It's good to have like, sort of a pro back it up because, yeah, he just, uh, was one of those players, he just, for me, whenever he got the ball, no matter how many, he just looked like he had all the time in the world. And I feel that's such a talent to have on the ball. Like you, and it's like a bit like you do say with the Spanish players, I think I have that the most of it. They just look like they've got all the time in the world, the Xavi's, the Iniesta's type thing. Mm. Um, but sort of back on topic, then, um, just wanted to mention this sort of one game because, Obviously, we talked about how quality Rangers were, but but this one game, uh, you play in the the PSG UEFA Cup, mm. um, the the penalty game, he, uh, Heinze, Arteta, Pochettino, Ronaldinho, Anelka, Akocha. I mean, was this? Did you go into that game a bit like I'm, I'm playing? I mean, obviously Ronaldinho and, and Arteta, no, they're probably more future stars at that time, but still JJ Akocha and, and players like that. Are you, are you thinking, wow, these are some serious players, or are you just completely used to it with what you've got at Rangers at that point? Can you think like that? You're, you're programmed to think you're the best in the business anyway. Yeah. And I remember I've told a story, I think, before. We're, we're standing in the tunnel, and, and Craig Moore's like just in front of me, and he's turned around and went, Have you been nervous, son? I was like, No. Nah. And I wasn't, it wasn't like I was being I was bravado or, or, or being full of myself, or what. I just wasn't, it was just programmed. I'm on it today. And I think we, we should have took them to the cleaners. It should never have been yeah. a penalty. We should have took them to the cleaners. Um, but again, in the days, you're just so programmed and so much testosterone in your own system, your own body. You're just like, I'm not caring who I'm playing against today. Mm. It was that kind of, we all kind of had that approach. Um, and yeah, but again, if, you, if you're saying all oh, Pochettino, I've got bad effects. You know what I mean? Yeah, we've got yeah, we've got, stars, we've got stars as well. So, oh, you've got Tor Andy Four, you've got we had also a lot of PVC playing as well. Um, uh, good one to check, but yeah, he was a, he was a superstar as well, wasn't he? In his own right, Russell. Yes. So you, you never ever think of that. You're not allowed to think of that because if you're in awe somebody, then you shouldn't be at Rangers. That's that was the kind of mindset we had. But can you still sort of take? notice of, of other players I mean he might not have but did, but did Ronaldinho ever stand out at that point and you're thinking he's going to be a massive player or, or just again you're just fully focused on the task at hand no, the, the one that when Anelka came on when he, he came over at my side I was like oh no here we go Anelka but no they, they, we, were, we just I think we were just so much better than them to be honest yeah. um, so there were like, uh, and again, so me in isolation, I've, I've touched on this before as well, so me in isolation against an Elka. So if I'm standing wide with, with an Elka running at me, he's going to rinse me because um, he's so quick and he's so technical. But when I've got Craig Moore on my inside and I've got Barry on my inside and I've got something, you know, it kind of, it, doesn't it just, you're not in isolation ever. Yeah. Um, so I would always try and position myself in an area that I've got to cover Craig Moore, anything down the side of Craig Moore, but the guy on the ball looks up and he sees that I'm close enough to Nelka that he's not going to game it. So you're having an impact on the match, even though you're not doing anything as yeah, such. Yeah. So that was always my, my kind of cat and mouse that I would play uh, within the game. Can I be close enough that he doesn't want to play him that? Um, but no too close that it gets sucked in the side of me. So it was a, yeah. it was a balancing act all the time. Um, but yeah, that was, that, was, that was some... When you look back at it, you go, oh, yeah, some side. <laughs> They did. They're ridiculous. So okay. this is obviously before the money. So, um, uh, Big Ek comes in 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 December of that year. Then, uh, and I mean, judging from the get, I mean, your game time seems to go up quite significantly uh, under McLeish. Um, again, is, it, is this not a conversation? This is just he, he likes you in the in these games. He, he seems to really favour you in the big games. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's there's so many things happening, and you know, you see, there was less money when the, the manager came in, uh, Alec McLeish. So that then has an impact on the, the stars that can come in. So there was less stars mm. under McLeish. You know? So you know, Geo'd left and all these big hitters were leaving. 
course, you still had quite a Canadian whatnot coming in, but it wasn't the same. Yeah, same amount of money being spent on players. So, no, there's, there's never any discussions. You know, it's it's one of the ones you, you you turn up to work every day. Sometimes there's energy. Sometimes you get played. Sometimes you're out of form. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the discussions he had with me were always uh, either to, you know show you where you were going wrong in, in terms of positioning or or, or whatever like that. Or slaughtering me for getting the ball away or whatever it was. Um but yeah, he, he seemed to always kind of favour me in the in the big games, the cup finals and whatnot. So yeah, listen. It's a good time either way. <coughs> yeah. Um end of that season then you, you go on to make your, your Scotland debut. Was this most people will say, and especially at that time, I think there was a, a lot more of a connect from, from Rangers to Scotland in terms of fans. Was is that always a massive ambitious to, to get cats to your country and, and how special? <laughs> No, not really. <laughs> I always felt because because we I was playing with twenty two internationals every day. Yeah. So when I went to this, it's not like you played with a lesser club and you go to Scotland and the level goes up when you're at Scotland training because everybody's yep. an international. But I'm pretty sure you know that Rangers team we had then. That's that's probably beating the Scotland team. You know when you look at the <laughs> probably hundred percent. Yeah. Well, it wasn't. As, yeah, of course you're you're proud to to get a cap and you're proud to sing a national anthem. That's so, all. You know that goes without saying. But my real pride comes in winning a treble with Rangers. That's that's when I think of the most proud I've ever been. It'd be that. Um, right. Like, yeah, I mean, just just looking at this, then I mean, you go on. You, you I mean, you get a fair few caps in a in a real short space of time for Scotland. It's you know you're you're almost sort of one of the first choices at Rangers. It's sort of upward trajectory. Are you, does, does this come into your mindset at any point? Are you thinking that you've got a big career ahead of you? Or, or I mean, are you probably expecting it in a way because you said that, that you always got to like, be programmed to think you're the best, but are you allowing yourself to think of, of you know, I'm Rangers first team, I'm Scotland first team, that, you know, the, the world's my oyster in terms of your future potential? Excuse me one second, man. That's, somebody's trying to call me here. Um, <laughs> so, oh, I, I, I think maybe, I don't know. Get carried away with yourself, maybe a wee bit when you're, you know, you're young and you're playing with Rangers and you're playing with Scotland. And you think you're a big ticket, but and mm. um, yeah, I just, I just felt what like, I think it over, I think it probably overachieved at Rangers. Um, mm. So then people then think, oh, you know, when you start going down to like a level, say down, you know, you're going to Wolves. You know what I mean? It's no like it's a, it's a low level. Yeah. Um, but if you look at my career, if my career was in reverse, it would be celebrated yeah. because you started Rangers and overachieve. It then yeah, looks yeah, like yeah. It's kind of drifted. Um, but yeah, I, I just feel that when I when I left Rangers, my mind was still at eye box. I'm still thinking midfielders are going to get into positions that I can get forward. And then when I wasn't getting these players, I was becoming less effective less effective um, because my, my my touches were less because of the, the you know yeah. the way that certain individuals would play and then I just I just I just didn't enjoy football as much because yeah it just you just want to play with the right players again you know and it just I get frustrated I cut a frustrated figure a lot in, in football um in my, in my older years so it's like yeah and become a wee bit moaning and a bit nippy with other people and, and whatnot so yeah i, I, I just it's just a, it's, a, it's the worst day of your life when you leave rangers uh, mm. as a footballer. you know nobody wants that it comes to everyone but it's a horrible day um uh, but we've got to just be grateful for, for for what i had there um and thankful that's that's kind of how i, I, I look at it yeah so it's a really good point actually you made about the the sort of career trajectory being in reverse because I've, I've never thought about that. Like you, you do, you do think that you do celebrate these players. I mean, Vardy's a classic example, isn't he? Going sort of from the bottom up. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you, you know, you can equally hit the height a lot earlier, and and then it's I guess the high isn't as high after that. But it's it is a really good point. Um, we move on to the sort of O one O two, and, and I've got to mention just the, the sort of cup final that year, uh, the three two over Celtic. Um. How special was that day? Because obviously, you, I mean, as I say, you were, you were quite trusted in these these games, in the old firm games. Um, and 
I mean, it was a bit frustrating, I think, as a fan, because I felt like we had the better of them that day anyway. But it was obviously a, a close thing in the end um, until Barry's free kick. And then, I mean, that that goal, that Love and Grand's goal was, was pretty much the last touch of the game. Mm. What What's that feeling like? No, that, goes on, like that was just raw emotion. I mean, I, I remember I was I was on the halfway line when Peter heads that in. And I'm actually signalling towards the Celtic fans. <laughs> <just> to <say. laughs> you can imagine what I was doing. Um, yeah, that's what we like to hear. Really. Just the halfway line there. And, you know, I would be picked up now. You could be getting in trouble for what I did then. Um, relief, joy, just because we were so so good that day, it was like, if we got penalties here, this is going to be a crime. Mm. Um, but we, Terry, we, Neil McCann, he's another one that doesn't get enough credit for me. Um, what a cross. I, no, but that was great, you know, and then a minute later, it's the last kick of the ball, basically, and then it's and then it's the final whistle, and then it's back to Ibrox for a, a mad party where you're... <laughs> Your Rangers tire in your head. Um, <laughs> that was special, special time. It was nice when we went through COVID to play the old games because I hadn't watched the game back. Really? So we sat here and we're having our dinner one night and just sat and watched it, and I was getting goosebumps and just <sighs> loving it. Just because that was actually the first time you watched it back. Never watched that. Yeah. Um, again, though, no, you're, you're you're 20 year old. You're you're a Rangers player, you think that's going to be every year and ah, we'll do it next year again. Yeah. It's, that's your, your kind of cocky mindset that you're, that, you're, that you're in in these days, but, you know, it doesn't always last. No, no, definitely not. I mean, um, 0-2 or 3 season, you know, you get your first Rangers goal against Limits. I mean, do you, do you remember that? Oh, aye, there wasn't many, so I do remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was obviously a much bigger one coming up, but, um, yeah, that was... Uh, that season as well, that you do get more Scotland caps, but the appearances do go down a little bit. Is there is there any injuries this season, or is it just sort of Rickson now is is a bit more Rickson, the white back of that? Much internationalist. Yeah, you know it's, and then you you've got other boys that Georgian internationalist that could play right back. You know you've then got you know, Alan Hutton then comes into the fold, and you know it's just what it was. It was just so many good players there that. There's only 11 can play. Yeah. You know, you're looking at boys in the stand. Emerson, guy played for massive clubs. Yeah. This, he's in the stand. Nellinger, in the stand. It's just, it was just a, a period of time where there was just quality in every position. And, and it's just sometimes you've just got to suck it up and sit on the bench for six weeks. As long as Rangers are winning, that's the only thing. And yeah. they want to be playing, of course, but as long as Rangers are winning, that's the only thing that they were, they were, you know, we were concerned with. We get the uh, the sort of final day drama on, on them that season as well, the the, the Dunfermline six one title win. Um, you, you're not in the match day squad. Are you, I mean, are you are you in and around the stadium? At, at oh, I, I, oh, I, oh, I, yes. Yeah. It was, yeah. <laughs> how was that? What, what was the th- sort of feeling with the, the squad going into that game? Because obviously it was you just got to outscore Celtic basically. Yeah, and that was it. Just just focus. But you look around. You, you just look at the, the players in there and go, nah, we are no, we are no in this league title. No chance. Uh, is, there, is there any sort of feeling of nerves when, when because I think they score a screen, don't they? They pretty much bang one straight in the corner and it's a bit like, oh no, this this could actually go quite wrong today. Um, you see that, but then I mean, the game, there was thousands of chances. So it yeah. was... It was uh, Ah, it was well deserved. I mean, the, the fact to see that Dunfermline lay down was was hilarious. I remember, <laughs> remember that. Dunfermline couldn't get near us um, because of the level of player that was there. Um, so no, nah, no, nah, it was it was obviously it's, it's nerve wracking because Celtic, are, you know, they're, they're banging in the goals as well because people yeah. are on their tries. Um, and and we, the way we were, we were in the Cooper Suite, which is kind of main stand left. Um, where the players used to sit, so you're, you're hearing everything that's going on. So, but yeah, I mean, that always that drove me insane. When you go, the, the, the Sutton comment always drives me insane purely because I think didn't they, they went 4 0 and they, they missed a penalty, I think, but that's not mm. Kilmarnock lying down. But apparently, <laughs> us winning 6 1 is, is done them lying down. Um, and I made it all much, all oh, so much better, didn't it? <laughs> 
so the next season sort of starts in and, and we lose, you know, Newman, Kanija, Conterman, Ammo, McCann, Fergie goes as well. Um, and, and like you said before, there's a bit of a budget in terms of, of what we can bring in, but are still sort of big names in their day, but maybe not on the same level, sort of Henningberg, Emerson's, as you mentioned, uh, Nunu Capucho, he was a bit of a, a wild one at times. Um, I remember and, and this is Nuno came into the club and he just won the Champions League. Yeah, it was with Porto, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. Yeah, and um, so we, we Jimmy Bell says, uh, Mo, I think Nuno Capucho wants your number. <laughs> and uh, so I just said, well, you're not getting it. It's my number. You know, he's not done anything for Rangers yet. You know, but that again, that was my mentality. Like, yeah. He's just won the Champions League. And I'm like, no, that's my number. <laughs> so, Does it, did, did he want your number? Yeah, because he was 21. Um, and I think he ended, oh, up, wow. think he ended up being 22 or 20 or something. Um, but we Jim was like, ah, you're not getting his number. You're not getting <laughs> it. And the manager pulled me in to say, look, can, can you not get your number? And like, now I cringe, I go, why didn't I just give him the number? You know, but in the days, I was like, no, that's my number. I've won trophies with that number. I want to keep that number. You know, that was the, the kind of stupidness in me at that, that time. But yeah, I could probably regret that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a fair enough thing, though. I mean, is that something you've ever had? Have you ever gone to another club and then sort of been like, oh, I want this number? Or has that never really been a big thing to you? Nah, nah. I was not I was not that type. Nah. Nah. But I always remember Stevie Thompson getting the chance to wear number nine and he took 19. <laughs> I said, Tom, well, you want to be the Rangers number nine or number 19? And he took 19. I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, that, was, was he number 19 before then? Was that, was that what no, it was? was or? Number nine. And he said, no, the pressure ahead number nine would be too much. I'm like, oh, Tom, well, you know, I can't believe he took 19. Imagine That's being the Rangers number nine. He did well for Rangers as well, to be fair. Yeah, he was he was fair. He was he was decent enough for it, Tomo. Um but you're also sort of seeing at this point because I, I know sort of under um McLeish we, eventually I think probably that when Barry does go, Rickson sort of starts playing a bit more cent- central in midfield, doesn't he, a little bit. Um yeah. uh, are you aware at this stage, obviously Hutton's come through, he's played a few games. Are you, are you aware that, that Hutton is, is he being billed as a big talent coming through or, or is he just a Another kid that's that's got potential. Not really, not really. I mean, he, he was a good player, you know. And he was he was very physical. He was very athletic, kind of similar to, to me in a sense. Um, a bit more powerful than, than I was in terms of his size. Um, but uh, I never I never felt oh this wee guy's on a different level. He's going to dispose of me. But um, but now he was, he was a good young lad, and, and, and obviously had a fantastic career with Rangers, making Rangers a lot of money and. I mean, he went on a three, four year period where he was arguably the best fullback in Britain. Um, he was outrageous, yeah. Oh, my God. So, you know, you credit your kid as you, you know, sometimes people are just better than you. Um, and you've just got to accept it. Move on. <laughs> it's, so it's, man. <laughs> it's fascinating to hear. Um, I, I'll sort of move on a little bit because I do, I do want to touch on sort of a bit after range as well. But, um, you know, you, you, you're going to go on and sign a four-year deal shortly. You know, you're an international footballer. Obviously, you go on eventually to make over 100 appearances for Rangers. Is there, before you leave, before that, that spray comes up, are you aware of any interest? Is there is there any sort of murmurs in England or anywhere else around? West, like West Ham tried to take me. Um, and I was down there. I went down. Uh, I trained with the team. That was like Michael Carrick. Wow. Uh, who else was down there at the time? Christian Dale was there, Don Hutchison, good players. Um, and I was due to be in the squad the next on the Saturday. So I would always go and sleep. I would always sleep in the afternoon. So I went back to the West Ham Hotel, which is in the stadium. Had my sleep, woke up, and I had Martin Bones, Martin Bain on the phone saying, uh, you've got to come back up the road. I was like, I'm not coming back up the road. I'm saying with West Ham. Uh, manager says you need to get back up the road. I was like, I'm not effing coming back. You know, that's because of yeah. it. I was like, this is unprofessional. Like, I'm doing here, West Ham of, you know, I'm coming to the team tomorrow. Kind of hang. I, was, I just didn't sit right me in it. And I said, well, what's the reason for it? And he says, well, Chris Bird got injured. I said, what's Chris Bird got an injured got to do with me? I said, well, Chris Bird's a right winger. I'm a right back. I well, we've got Champions League on Wednesday. And so you, you're playing that and then you can go down to them on the Thursday. Champions League came, never played. And then come the Thursday, 
West Ham pulled the plug. So, yeah, that, that made me a bit... Yeah, um, definitely. That stuck in my throat a wee bit, if I'm honest. Um, listen, these things happen, you know. A few months later, I'm playing in the cup final, and we score, and we beat Motherwell 5-1 or something. So, I can't be too critical of it, but it, it stung at the time because I thought West Ham, I think they went up to the Premier League that year, um, or they were mm. supposed to. So, you know, could have been an exciting time, but you know what? I ended up scoring a cup final goal for Rangers, so it was no bad. No, definitely. Not. I mean, could, could you have dug your heels in, or, or was that it was it ball still in Rangers court to just pull the plug at that point? I'm a player. I'm a Rangers player. Rangers yeah. aside, it's not like I was a, a player of power or position. So maybe another player could have dug their heels in and got a bit. I was, I was just a wee Scottish guy. You know what I mean? I wasn't going to be able to challenge. Al oh, McLeishan and Rangers as an institution. So back up the road and get on with it. Yeah, I mean, it was a great point to go into that sort of uh, the, the last sort of bit on Rangers in um, Cup final, Motherwell. I mean, I remember watching this as I was only young, but just seeing early off in the game. And, and I mean, I, I remember thinking, I don't know what, what my Ross is, is doing there. Like he's like sort of the last man up top and he's, he's strikers sort of dink over the keeper. Um, unbelievable finish. How special was that as a moment scoring a cup final of the Rangers? Sort of like what dreams are made of? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember quite. It was, I mean, it was a great ball for Biffle, but if, if you imagine it, so they talk about these runs all the time nowadays because everybody's an expert on Monday night football, isn't it? Um, but it was like, kind of like an underlap. So I've, I've played it in my left foot, underlap Biffle, and he just clipped it in. And to be fair, if Gordon Marshall doesn't run out, I'm never scoring that. Um, <laughs> ballooning that over a bar or whatever but he made it easy for me to be honest um but yeah when it hit the net i mean i ran away like as if i did it every week you know what i mean <laughs> the arms out and that. They're, they're the sort of goals that, that, that make it they, i just I feel, I feel like they relieve all the pressure don't they if you, if you can get one early enough especially in the cup final and obviously it was it was um it was cruise control after that yeah. um you you sort of uh, i've mentioned earlier you sort of, you've signed a four-year deal around this time um you know i mean your market value must have been pretty high at that point let's say like 100 games for rangers you're scotland and that's just um and then you know shortly after that season you're, you're scoring a cup final goal and then in the summer you're, you're leaving sort of what what led to that point was it was it rangers choice or was it you just maybe you wanted more well, well, first team well, football? Rangers, rangers did say that they were going to try and promote um uh, Hutton and, and play him more. Yeah. So it was one of the ones you want to set about or do you want to go and play? And at that age, you just want to play. Yeah. Um, but I should have stayed in the building. That's probably my biggest regret. I should have stayed in the building because you're still a Rangers player. There's a value to being a Rangers player. Being an ex Rangers player, there's a less value. So I could have been in the building and went on loan to maybe a, a Wolves or a West Ham or yeah. whatever it was. It's still been a ranger, so I think that's probably my biggest mistake. Um, becoming an ex ranger square too early, um, because you never know. No, you know, I, think, I think Hutton breaks his leg in my final year, yeah, he does. That then leads to me playing in cup finals, and da, 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 da. but then Alan's coming back, you know, he's still a good player, and he's going, he's going to kind of get, get back in the team. So, um, I, there's loads of permutations in football. You know, some of them go for you, some of them go against you. Um, but yeah, market value, I don't even know what that would be. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, you talk about permutations, but I mean, you, you know, you go to Sheffield Wednesday, which is obviously a big club as well. And, and you know, again, if you, if you do well there, you've got the whole world watching, really. Um, what Were there more than, I, I imagine there's more than, than Sheffield Wednesday um, interest. I mean, I've, I think I've read. Have you, was it you've worked with Paul Sturrock before? Was that sort of a, a driving force, or you know, when you walk into a room, you just know you've made a mistake. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, it was that. I went on. Oh, <laughs> what? And then I think the four weeks in there, I think he he left me at the squad. Mate, I was playing my Rangers six weeks ago, and you can't—I can't get in a Sheffield Wednesday squad. And I was—I was not having that, so I just right. went right. Uh, so I went to the training ground, picked up my boots, and left. 
Really? Oh, mate, and I said, what are you? He said, you're not going to... The, the game, I said, no, nah, I'm not on the squad. I said, so, uh, am I heading up the road? I'll not be going back there. I said, so get my contract terminated. And a week later, I signed for Wolves. Wow. It was, it was as, I was as stubborn as... And probably stupid and unprofessional if you, uh, for, for behaving like that. But I just thought, nah, I can't be done here and, and no getting again for Sheffield Wednesday. Um, mm. At that time, you know, rightly or wrongly. Um, but uh, that was it. I'm not going back. I've got my boots. That was it. A week later, I mean, signing with Glenn Hoddle. Yeah, as I say, you, you, you go to Wolves, uh, I mean, initially on loan, you, you make it permanent under Glenn Hoddle. Um, you know, there's, there's a few Scots there as well. There's Colin Cameron, McNara, uh, Kenny Miller as well. Mm. Um, do, do these guys make it easier when you join in, just that guys you might know around the international setup, or does it not really make a difference? See, when you, see, see dressing rooms, they're great places. You, you go in and you automatically con- you'll connect with someone. Mm. And Wolves are really connected with Mark Kennedy, um, the ex Liverpool okay. player. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was a cracking guy. Um, but again, though, no, what I was used to at Rangers, internationalists, I'm going in there, I'm seeing Ince, Anderton, Kenny Miller, Colin Cameron, Julian Lescott, you know, Jody Crader. Yeah. Other good football players. It does, yeah, yeah. So straight away, I'm going, this feels like, this is what I'm used to. This is what it feels like. So the training was on, the bang on, the hygiene, everything was just perfect. And it just felt like a proper football club. Um, yeah, so some players in that direction. Oh, yo, yo. <laughs> does, does Glenn Hoddle still join? Because I've read a few things that Hoddle was in training, uh, not maybe at Wolves, but before, and he was still outrageous. But was oh, he not good. really joining? He was really. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> and he knew it. And you were just. Really? Like, How have you even seen that boy? And he would just wink at you as if you were like a wee, a wee guy. <laughs> what, a, what a talent, man. But what a, what a class act as well, though. He was a special really? man, a uh, special, special man, pure class. A lot of time for him. Um, just, just, just loves football. Just mm. loves football. Like, and I love people that love football because th- there are people in the game that just pick up their wage and they do it enough. And yeah. He was just neurotic about the game, and I loved that because um, I can, I can see that side of me and, and, and myself so um ah, but just never shouted never bawling and shouting just calm put bullet points bang just great really good that's really i mean it's you it, it raise a really good point because i've read them obviously there's been players i think david batty was was someone who apparently hated football absolutely hated it just found out that he was good at it and then that was it for him he just picked out his wage and and uh, no, nothing else really mattered to him um so Mick McCarthy comes in then under Wolves. Um, you leave at the end of that season. Mm. Is that? Do, do you discuss anything with Mick McCarthy? Is it? I never even met. Him. Never even. Oh met. really? No. So, but then then obviously went into to to Millwall and, and got injured quite quickly. Mm. And again, it just didn't feel right. And then got a chance to go into Scandinavian football with, and, and finished top three with the uh, Vikings of Iron and played in Europe. Um. And now I've got two beautiful Scandinavian daughters, Norwegian daughters now. So it's I enjoyed that club. That was a that was a that was a good experience being in Norway. Um, it's some, fascinating. Some good... Yeah, I mean, I want I want to, I can't really deep dive into Norway, but um, I mean, my, my granddad's Norwegian, and it's like yeah, obviously it's an amazing country. Um, but did, did you have any reservations when when that opportunity came up? Was did you playing in Europe? Was that ever an ambition for you, or? Um, he just went, well, I said, first and foremost, I said, who's the team? Viking Stavanger. Looked up their new stadium, brand new stadium, training pitches of Bowling Green. Stavanger's 500 kilometres for, for Scotland. I said, let's go. I loved it. Playing in Europe, playing against Rosenberg, playing against Bowling, all these big clubs. Stadiums are immaculate. Salaries were, were you know, decent at the time. Um, that was a great experience. And I would encourage anybody to go, go and play abroad. Um, wow! Yeah, it was, it was good fun, and obviously I've got I can speak a language now, and I've got two beautiful daughters, so it's that was worthwhile. Yeah, definitely, it was absolutely amazing. Um, you obviously you you come back, you you have a, a brief spell um with Aberdeen. You, you sort of, it's, I mean, it, 
the, the research just says that you were using their facilities and like, I think you see this a lot don't your players sort of use the facilities and then they end up signing a sort of short-term deal mm. um but I really wanted such you, you go to China um mm. how, I mean how did that come about well I was at Aberdeen Aberdeen offered me a, a long contract that period but the amount of money that we get in China for one year was the same as the that we get for the three year at Aberdeen wow okay <sighs> Probably a big mistake was doing that. I should have signed at Aberdeen. Um, yeah. Aberdeen was a really good club, really good people. Um, and I thought, being a Dundonian ex Rangers player, going up to Aberdeen, I thought, I might be in for a bit of bother up here. <laughs> but the city were wonderful people. Uh, and the club was just a really nice environment for people. Um, with good teams as well, to be fair. That, that was a big mistake. I should have signed on the three year deal there. Um, but went to China. Oh, that was tough. That was tough. Um, I had a translator, but I'm sure my translator was saying whatever because every time I spoke, the the, the manager was just going mental. I was being positive. Did you? What did you tell him? And he said, "Oh, I said what you said and that." I think he was just saying he's. I think he was making it up. Um, so I ended up. I played every single match. We were sitting top of the league. I played every match. We were through to the Europe, the, the, the Asian Champions League yeah. stage, uh, the, the, the knockout stages, which was the, the the aim of the club. Played every match to the half, and then I got an email. Oh, the club didn't want you to be here, so I phoned up the club. You know, want me back? Yeah, I want you back. I said, well, this email here. Oh, we don't know nothing about it. I'm like, okay, and then never played again. Never played again. So just sat there and just. Picked up my salary and just trained. That was it. So it was, wow. it was a weird situation. I don't know what happened there. Something, something is odd. Yeah. Um, yes. But that was that was a that was a mad experience as well. I mean, see if you got your bonus. So you would just go to this wee office in the stadium, right? And this wee woman would just go into what, a big, you know, one of the old fashioned safes, the big hairy yeah. things. <laughs> just pull, pull it up. What's a Chinese remnant B? It was called. And just you know the machines like you see in the mafia. Brrr, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Just, and put your bonus in a wee brown bag. Just that was you. Wait at the shop with <laughs> a wee brown bag. <laughs> Smart. You never see that in, in, in British football. I don't know if they still do that now, but it was it was bizarre. How how are you with? I uh, know we're a bit pushed up. We've got a couple more, but how are you with the? the I mean, my, my wife is is part Chinese, so she's like she even she's like she only visited because her parents are Chinese. Mm. Um, she's she's born in London. Um, and when she went out there for the first time for like a month, even for her, who's, who's brought up on Chinese culture, it was a bit of a shock to her. Was it Was it a bit of a shock to the system going completely abroad, even outside of Europe? Yeah, it was. When, when I looked at the Japanese, when we played them, and I looked at the South Koreans when we played them, I always felt that there was an unprofessionalism with the, with the and we were the champions, we were the biggest club in there. Mm. It was just unprofessionalism for me. Really? I was never trained hard enough, no eating the right food, just it was something that I just, this, isn't, this is not right, this is not what I'm used to, but because I'm that type that speaks up, oh, problem guy, I'm not a problem guy, but why are we, you know, training for 40 minutes? Yeah. Training for longer than that, how can you train your body for 40 minutes and then and expect to come on a Saturday and play 95 at high mm -hmm. level? So again, ah, oh, Ross, he's a problem guy. He's a problem, always moaning. Well, it's no moaning. It's just the standards are not acceptable. Yeah. To me. Now, should I have shut up and just got on with it? Maybe. But I then think, well, I've been at Champions League level. I know the standards that need to be met day to day. So I wasn't looking down on it, but I'm going, well, I know the level that should be it and how you need to train. Because I've seen all these top players train and it's that every single day. There's no shortcuts. And we're, yeah. taking, we're taking shortcuts and it just didn't sit right with me. But hey ho, it's done now. No, definitely. I think, I think, I mean, you have a great point, don't you? Because you've, as I say, you've trained with some of the best players in the world. So you'd think that, that Mo Ross would, would have some sort of idea. Um, so just, just sort of finishing off, then you move into a sort of coaching career. Um, you you, um, you go with, is it Solar? How do you, how do you, is that just how you local, say it? It's just a local club that got relegated to the fourth division. Had no players, 
So I just went and, and that was me cutting my teeth as a manager. And we did very well at that football club. Um, took them to fourth division right up to the second division, double promotions, finished fifth. And the club have never been as high since. Uh, we knocked out mm. a Premier League club in the cup. So it was good. And then I moved on from there and went to the Faroe Islands, which is an interesting place as well. But I, I just wanted to get better at my coaching. And that's that's where my passion is. It's, it's making footballers better. Um, yeah. And that's my real, real passion in life, making a difference to football players. Yeah, you yeah I mean, of, things, of course you do. But seeing when a player just gets it, that gives me satisfaction. Yeah, definitely. I, I was just, I've read like so many good things about your sort of coaching side of things, even from like Motherwell and Notts County. Um, and, and, and after Notts County, of course, you, you move on to your current role, which is Cowden B. Mm. Um, you know, I guess, how is that going, A? And B, I mean, how, how are you finding this this Lowland League with a bit? It's, it's just a bit crazy, isn't it? With the, you've got the B team, you've got this open goal broom heel in there, and it's just a bit of a mad league at the moment. Yeah, I, I sometimes scratch my head, to be honest. Um, however, I'm very grateful that the chairman gave me a, gave me a role um, at the club. Uh, considering the circumstance around it, but I feel I'm probably yeah I'm operating at a, a level lower than it than I should be. Um, but listen, I'm dedicated to my sport. Uh, I work hard. Um, I'll get back up to the level um, pretty soon, I think. Um, I believe in that 100%. I don't doubt it one bit. Um, but at this moment in time, I just need to. Remain loyal to Cowden Beath, um, who showed, you know, who gave me an opportunity. So yeah. I need to be loyal to to this football club, which I will be, and and then see what happens in the future. Fantastic! I've got no doubt, absolutely no doubt as well, because you're a very articulate guy, very intelligent. Obviously, the passion shines through for me. Um, just finishing, if you're all right, it was just it's like sort of a couple of quick fire questions, just a, a couple of the guys sent in. Um, and they're just like box fan and stuff. Just so best player you've played with? Barry. Barry, brilliant. Best player you played against? But I mean, obviously the, the famous ones is your Messi's and your Ronaldo's, but the one that when I played against him, I thought, oh, you're tasty. It was overmarch. He was really oh, oh, I, he mentally drained me. Because if if you if you if you try and if you try to get too tight to him, he puts it past you. If you all stand off him, he gets a run at you. It, it, it was constant. It was just he was an intelligent footballer, but quick. Oh my god. <laughs> um, best manager. Pound for pound. Oh, it's a tough one. I won most things under Al McQuish. I'd probably say I enjoyed, do you know what? I wouldn't even go manager. I would say the best person I've worked with was Jan Bouters as a coach. Okay, on the dick, right. Just, okay. because, just because of what impact he's had in my mind and my brain. That Just a very, very, very tactically astute football man. Um, but I'm grateful to all my managers, you know, Walter for signing me, Dick for giving me debut, Walter, uh, uh, Al McCush for putting his trust in me and, and playing in, in some massive games, um, Hoddle for just his approach and just the, the man, you know. When you see Rio Ferdinand and David Beckham and that talk about Hoddle, then I'm like, mm. I've been lucky enough to be part of that as well. So. <laughs> yeah. um, and and sort of last last two then, uh, it's a bit of a different one, but the thoughts on, on, on Rangers currently? I mean, obviously Gio's um, just left the club and, and Michael Bill's come back in. Um, is that just the nature of the beast at the moment? Like, especially in modern football uh, you find this so you don't really get the time out and, and I think with Geo's maybe a bit more because the, the, maybe the performances weren't backing it up but um, do, do you think that was the, the right decision or as a fellow you see fellow managers are sort of like they, they weigh up more about the, the giving the manager time um, I think there's a lot went on in the club that has not been public knowledge I think there's there was a lot of money pumped into Rangers to stop 10 in a row yeah, that money wasn't for free, so that money now needs to be paid back, which means that Geo never got the funds that he maybe should have had. Considering, so it's a business decision. It's the football club. 
And if the football club make a decision, we've got to support it. Um, and time will tell. I think Michael Beale's an exciting coach. Um, yep. I don't know what comes from 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 the management side, but he, he's certainly in the sound bite. Some the we get, he is. He certainly gets. He gets the club. He talks properly. Yeah. He gets the values of a football club, and if he's given a wee bit of money and a wee bit of a wee bit of time to go to go and freshen us up, I think you'll see uh, an exciting Rangers team. Fantastic. Um, and last question. You basically you are given a button, you push the button, um, you go back to sort of a fork in the road in your career, and, and it might, you know, it might be that there's nothing for you, but is there is there a moment you can go back to and, and you'd like to push this button and you, you could basically play out a different side of your career on a specific decision, whether that's staying at Rangers, leaving Rangers, and, and and this just shows you it gives you basically a snapshot of what would have happened if you went the other way. I think if I'd stayed at Rangers, I still think Alan Hutton would have played ahead of me. So I would probably say no, that was the right decision as such. Leaving yeah. Aberdeen to go to China was the, the one moment I thought, yeah, that's the biggest mistake I've done. Um, but hey-ho, that is what it is. Um, I've had some experiences, good and bad. Um, so nah, look forward. I don't regret anything. No, um, and that's that's pretty much it for me. No, I mean it's it's honestly been an absolute pleasure. You speak so well, obviously, about the club and about everything else. So I, I just want to wish you all the best with with Cowden Beef. Um, you know, I already keeping an eye out for any 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 sort of uh, <laughs> any sort of ex Rangers fans we're keeping an eye out for, and, and um, yeah, just just wish you all the best, and, and thank you very much for coming on. Brilliant, thanks for having me. Cheers. Brilliant. Cheers, Mike.